ride the finest horse I've ever seen. I was born in a bender, and I am a gypsy. Um, I mean, I understood that the gypsies originally came from somewhere in India and uh, uh, 2,000 years ago and gradually made their way towards Europe and some of them stopped off here and there and settled and eventually some of them got to England and then uh, and Wales and then some eventually crossed the Irish Channel and ended up in Ireland. But uh, and I'd love to know more about that. Well, the first one I've found so far uh, was from 1547, which is quite early in the, in the time of the Gypsies in Britain. And that was a, a record in the Southampton Stewards book, the sort of accounts of the, of the city of Southampton. Uh, unfortunately, quite a sparse record, but it, it does say that the Southampton Steward paid uh, a Flemish sea captain four pounds for the transport of the Egyptians. Now whether that was an outward journey or an inward journey, I, I've got no idea. But given the laws extant at the time, I should think it was uh, uh, a deportation. And that's the earliest I've found so far. Well, I was born in the compound. This is where I was born and bred, shall we say. That was where I was brought up, in this area. Was yeah, I was born just down through there under the yew trees, and I was born over here, and Jimmy was born up here under the yew trees. The only thing you could do was make clothes, bake, sell flowers, work in the fields, such as strawberry picking, potato picking, and hot picking, harvesting. I mean, this we had to do to survive. Otherwise, we would have never survived. Our annual holiday was to go from here to Walton, hot picking. We'd pack up everything and put it up on the horse and cart. You, they had to go and pick hops so they could buy children's shoes for the winter. Well, I was just born into a gypsy family. The policeman come in through the roadway here, which was around here, and he took us off to the army. Cut a long story short. They took us off. We went, went in the army and uh, while we were away, they closed the compound down. Um, during the war, there was very heavy bombing in Southampton and a lot of people escaped from the bombing and went into the forest and, uh, and uh, put themselves up in any bits of shelter they could find. Um, such as hen houses and uh, old motor cars and so on, and lived rough. And anybody moved in, first come, first serve, they used to move in because they needed somewhere to live. There was no house. You, but this area was flat, my friend. You can't, I, I'm not being sarcastic, but you can't visualise what it was like. There was more holes around this area. You could live in a hole more than you could in a house. In the 50s and 60s, we'd, we'd, we'd just got the welfare state, but then it started looking at poverty and, uh, and of course, the returning soldiers from the war wanted a new, a new Britain. Uh, and the welfare state, being what it was, uh, said, you know, our citizens can't live like this, uh, and thought they were going to better them by, by forcing them into council houses. I mean, years ago, when I was a girl, you got no social security, you got no welfare, you got nothing. In a sense, they were better off in, you know, than being in the ramshackle places that were in the compound. It was usual for there to be lots of animals, dogs, cats and chickens um, running around in the house uh, and um, also there often seemed to be a lot of broken glass around outside uh, and um, 
lots of the children didn't seem to have any shoes and it was very worrying to see, see them picking their way amongst the broken glass. So it, was, it wasn't really terribly nice for most of them, I don't think. Um, and they started looking at poverty. In 1947, the uh, uh, New Forest was examined to uh, see what, what, res what the um, results damaged i.e. Um, how the woodland had been depleted uh, during the Second World War and they commissioned a report uh, colloquially known as the Baker Report which looked at everything in the forest including the gypsy compounds and they were horrified at, at what they saw as squalor but which in fact were, were um, uh, united sort of self, uh, self-sufficient, self-supporting communities uh, and the welfare state being what it was uh, said, you know, our citizens can't live like this. Uh, I thought they were going to better them by, by forcing them into council houses. Again, of course, we had our own water supply and everything there, so it was self-contained. And they built a housing estate. You asked me this morning about being back in the house. I mean, this more better idea than what it has been in that house. A prison, I call it, a prison. I have met one or two people who were there in those days and they remember it very happily. So it wasn't... Uh, it's a bit difficult to know how to judge it, really. But equally, they broke up these hugely interdependent communities and scattered the people all over um, with, with no thought to um, extended family support or... Or, or anything like that. There must have been 40 or 50 families. Pushed them in alongside people who, who didn't want them there. Um, and within a very few years, the culture took a pretty steep dive. Um, the very last one out was, was Mabel and Morris Cooper in 1963. And immediately, the day they put them out, they, they turned the bulldozers in and bulldozed everything clear. That was in Shave Green. They'd already got them out of Thorny Hill into sort of um, training bungalows uh, and then into council houses. But you know, where is your roots? Nowhere, because they pulled our place down. We don't have anywhere. And there was a gypsy compound up the road, and they were all so nice and friendly, and, you know, they used to come and talk to my gran and come and visit my gran, and, you know, there were no trouble whatsoever. And we used to go out there and talk to some of them. Most of them were moved from the compound up to here, and that was the one that we, we had in the 50s. Like 64 houses they built there. Yeah, this is the very where, first house. When they built that, oh, we yeah, moved. You remember? That, Hello, that darling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, my love? Prejudice against gypsies will never, never die. Because it doesn't matter where we tried to live or where we didn't. We got nowhere. We had to make our own way. The only difference between, with respect to you and I, is the fate of birth. I was born a gypsy. I can't help being born a gypsy. I've got two legs, two arms, one head. I don't have two heads and horns, you know, and I'm not a criminal. I've got, I haven't got any criminal record at all. Nothing whatsoever on my record. Um, if you think about um, uh, some of the name-calling that used to take place against people from um, from Africa or from the Indian subcontinent. You, thankfully, we don't hear any of that today. That's some, now something of, you know, something of the past. But you still hear pikey jokes. Now, pikey is an extremely offensive word to a gypsy, yet you can hear on the BBC even today, you'll hear presenters talking about pikeys and making jokes and, and you know that's something we complain about but it still goes on and it, it's got to stop it's sheer racism but the position is we're all gypsies are all criminals we've all been sponging off the country i've never 
I was, well, I am out of work now because, like I say, I'm long retired. But I've never been out of work in my life. I've always worked. I've never had anything off. But according to all the newspaper reports, you see, all gypsies are spangers. They do this, they do that. Um, gypsies and travellers are probably the most marginalised, the most socially excluded of all the minority ethnic groups in the UK today. My brother, when he left school, he went to Lindhurst for, to the Labour Exchange for a job. That was all right when they were taking the particulars, his name. But when it came to his address, they didn't want to know because he had no fixed abode. See, this kind of thing you get, and that is prejudice. Hampshire, in fact, have had a lot of opposition to their sites, and the one in the forest, in particular, has had a lot of opposition. A hundred sites were identified between 1979 and 1988. This year. But the present site that has been identified is at the moment the subject of a public inquiry, the second one. On the first occasion, the county council won the right to provide a site near Totten, near to the place where the gypsies had always frequented, but the opposition took it to appeal. Their appeal was upheld, and there was another public inquiry just this August, and we're now awaiting the result of that. Lenny Smith, before he died, him and I went and viewed the land in Southampton. They said, yes, that would be ideal for a site. It went all through, and then the people of Swathing jumped on a bandwagon and said, we don't want gypsies here. Immediately they said that, that was racist. Did they do anything about it? Everything poo-pooed it, let it go on. But because yeah. we're gypsies, nothing gets done. This is the sort of thing that we live with day in, day out, and it's still going on. So I've got a young son, grandson of three weeks, and I need him to grow up in a world where he really truly knows where he comes from. So no, it's really, really crucial. Well, I'm just proud to be a gypsy.